colleagues that, that are represented here in this room. And, and thank you for um, what you've been doing in, in each one of our lives in the last week, in the last month. Uh, and, and thank you that you're never done with us and that we're always a work in process, but that you're interested in us becoming more and more like you, Jesus. And we pray that we would be willing to, to go through the, the pain and the effort and the, and the, the molding um, to be, to smell like you, Jesus, in this world that has a lot of stink in it. And so, Lord, we just uh, we, um, give this next three hours over to you and ask that you, in your grace, you would bless this time together and that we would um, learn something important uh, about you and learn something important about ourselves before three times holy God. Um, may you bless this, uh, this time together. In your name, Jesus, amen. All right, so we got it set up with Sean, so if it doesn't work, it's his fault, not mine. No, no, I know, I know, okay, yeah, yeah. I'm getting there, I'm getting there. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so I can't see it anymore, Sean. Oh, here it is. I got it. I got it. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Why did it work for you and not for me? It's always the case. So, duck. It's just not. I can't drag it. I don't know what the deal is. Yeah, hold on. So I like this. Duck. Yeah, there we go. And how do I get on the full screen? Ah, voila. There it is. Okay. What? de solides relations, des temps de préparation et de travail en commun, ou des temps en même comme en montagne ou autour de son d'un café, c'est des occasions uniques pour créer des souvenirs qui durent toute la vie. Le but ultime de cette école reste la transformation de la présence de Dieu dans la vie de chaque étudiant. Défi est une occasion unique pour grandir dans sa relation avec le Seigneur, apprendre à se connaître et ancrer profondément 
solidarité en Jésus-Christ. Une véritable So that gives you just a little bit of idea of uh, Chamfleury and where we are in, in France and a little bit what we do. It's, it's like here. It's in a, a beautiful place as well, just a lot colder. <laughs> than, uh, what? But also a lot mm, It's pretty. What? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we had a, the, the last three weeks of, of school, I put on a foosball and a ping pong tournament. Yeah, it's a. Do you, do you play ping pong? Yeah, so you would really like to have a, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> oh, really? Who's the best? Oh, oh. <laughs> how, how do you know if you haven't played? We play every game. Seth and I are pretty close. Okay, all right. Who usually wins? Seth? Seth. Did y'all play in a club? Do, do you play? In France, every sport you do, you have to play in a club. Every single sport, you have to be a member of a club. Did you play a club? No. All right. So, uh, fuck. All right. Uh, Book of James, Marks of a Mature Christian, Chapter 1. What is the first mark of a mature Christian, according to James? He's patient in, he or she is patient in, patient in testing. Chapter 2, in general? He or she practices what? The truth and faith. Voila. Very good. And we started uh, yesterday with the third mark of mature Christian. He or she controls his tongue. And we saw six images that were boiled down into three, the three powers of the tongue. First two images, a rudder of the boat and a bit in the, uh, of the horse. And what is that power? The power to direct. The power to direct. Second two images that uh, uh, James used? Fire and wild animals. Wild animals. And what, what is that? The second power? Destruction. The power to destroy, according to James, the images of a... And it's not just uh, wild animals with uh, fangs and claws, but also we talked about the venom of a snake, which is very s- subtle but still comes to the same end. And then the third power, what were the two images? Tree and, do you remember? Source, source uh, or spring, water. And the, and the third power of the tongue, according to James, was to give life. give life. Excellent. And so then we started looking at yesterday, the last uh, five uh, verses of, the, of chapter 3, which is um, talked about wisdom. And we said that wisdom it doesn't necessarily mean intelligence. You can be wise and intelligent, but it doesn't have to. It's not, cannot, it's not necessarily directly related to the amount of intelligence that we have. And then there was a, a, a formula. Well, in the Bible, wisdom has come to be known, the, the capacity to live well to be known as, the capacity to live well or to live life as it ought to be lived. So a wise person is someone who knows how to live, and at the end of his life, he has something to show for it, other than a big house and a fast car. And so uh, he, James talks about, there, there's a, a formula, like a process. If you're wise, then you will experience what? He, he, he talks about it in, in these verses. It's a, it's a formula. Wisdom begets you understand who you are before a three times holy God, and so that is very humbling for you. It begets humility, and humility is others-centered and not self-centered, and so it begets good deeds, good works. Very good. And so now we're going to look at, uh, we, we read it yesterday, so we're not going to reread it um, today. Um, uh, the, the idea of, okay, we, we get that wisdom is important, so... How do we get wisdom? And basically, James, he says, um, there's two types of wisdom. There's wisdom that comes from above, and there's earthly wisdom. And so, basically, he describes the two, and he says, heavenly wisdom 
is from God and is life-giving. Heavenly wisdom it comes from above, comes from God, and it gives life. And earthly wisdom is not from God, and it is unspiritual. He, he describes it a little differently, but it, that uh, begs a lot of, of questions. He, he basically says it's, it's of the devil. Um, earthly wisdom uh, is, is from the, the part of man that is not glorifying to God, even though man is uh, created in the image of God. And so we need to humble our hearts and tame our tongue. So we're still in the, in the, in the context of uh, controlling the tongue. So tame our hearts, control our tongues. And that is why uh, wisdom and humility have to go together. So if you truly know yourself, then you see you're some, you're yourself as someone in need of God's grace. If you understand just how lost you are, not thinking like I did for the longest time, I'm a good boy because people were telling me I was a good boy, thinking that I was good, thinking that it was only like 7% of things that weren't so good that I didn't want to look at. Actually, it's more like 97% <laughs> of things in me that are, uh, were not good. Um, but when you see yourself before uh, three times holy God, then you see just how much you're in need of the grace of God. And so you humble yourself before the Lord. And you know that everything that you do in this life is all because of God's grace. And Charles Stanley, uh, Baptist minister in Atlanta, Georgia, he says, earthly wisdom is doing what comes naturally, depending if you're uh, listening to the, your sinful nature, but godly wisdom is doing what the Holy Spirit compels us to do. Yes. So, yes, I know what the question is, but go for it. Yes. Well, I would say man, that's a very good question because we don't receive the Spirit until we, by faith, have reached out to Christ and accepted that uh, in His perfection, he became sin for us on the cross so that we might be saved because we know that we need him. So there's a spiritual transaction that takes place whenever that happens and we become regenerated. We, we have new life in Christ through the Holy Spirit. So um, because we are created in the image of God, even if we aren't in Christ, there is that part of us that... God has given us that, that reflects his image, even though we're sinful human beings, not saved. So, yeah, and this, that's why I, I have a little more, I'm honest with you in this. We talk about human, human wisdom because some, some people have said, well, you know, there are wise men, humanly speaking, who don't know Christ, who live life in humility, and they do do good works. So, for me, J James, he, he says uh, very clearly, um, there's a, a huge difference between uh, wisdom from earthly wisdom and, and heavenly wisdom, which I, I agree with. But there is a part of that human earthly wisdom that is still reflecting uh, the creator God in us. So, yeah, it, it's only by the grace of God that we can accept Christ. And when we re accept Christ, we receive the spirit. But there is the, 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 the whispering of the spirit in our souls so that we can accept its irresistible grace according to, to John Calvin. So uh, for me, it's not as cut and dried. Uh, Cooper's not here, but black and white. It, it, it's a little gray, <laughs> the difference between humanly wisdom and godly wisdom. Of course, godly wisdom only comes from God. But we have to have enough wisdom that lends itself to humility that allows us to be able to reach out in faith and accept what Christ has done. So I don't know if that answered your question. Can you ask your question again? No, that last part you said. Yeah. Saving faith. Our, our, yeah, our is not Never enough. Yeah, but we do have to have the, the, the compelling, the pushing of the Holy Spirit to, to be able to see ourselves. When we truly see ourselves as sinful human beings, then that is what pushes us to want to reach out to, to, to something that is, is greater and perfect and whole and beautiful, which is Christ himself. Yeah, so it's not, for me, it's not as cut and dried. And it's only, but it's only through the, 
power of the Holy Spirit that we can ever be able to, to accept what Christ has done for us. So the, a bit of humanly wisdom, but compelled by, pushed by the Holy Spirit. And so then um, at the end of the verses 17 and 18, um, James, he uh, says that wisdom has effects. If we are truly wise, then it comes from humility, which uh, shows itself in what? We already said it. Humility, uh, wisdom begets humility, begets good deeds. And so just like faith, when we said the, the when we're talking about faith in chapter 2, dynamic faith, lends itself to good works. Well, the same thing with wisdom. Wisdom lends itself to, you, you see what? what? The fruit. You see fruit of wisdom in, in, in godly, wise people's lives. And so verse 17, he says, wisdom is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And sincere. Wow. I'll read it again. Wisdom is first of all pure, uh, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Who, who wants that to be a, a description of your life? I would so, I want this, verse 17, to describe, but to, to, to do that, to become this wise person, it's linked to humility, and there are fruit that show themselves in life. And it's compared directly to earthly wisdom, verse 16. Earthly wisdom sets people up. Uh, it, uh, it, it says, earthly wisdom is envious, selfish, leading to disorder, chaos, and evil. And so earthly wisdom sets people apart. Godly wisdom brings people together in harmony, in love, in peace. In other words, heavenly wisdom <clears throat> shows itself relationally. Question, here at Anchor House, have you seen people who have shown the fruit of the Spirit in their lives in that they, their wisdom has shown itself in your relationships here at Anchor House that has brought y'all together and not pushed you apart, as with earthly wisdom? And so, Heavenly wisdom shows itself in the way we live our relationships with one another. Amazing, right? Wisdom, you think it's, oh, this, this person who just has a, a smart thing to say every now and then. No, wisdom <laughs> comes from the, um, lends itself to, to the humility, which lends itself to the good works, but actually it's good works that bring us together relationally. So James goes on to say that heavenly wisdom produces a harvest of righteousness in verse 18. And there's two ways that heavenly wisdom produces righteousness. No wrong answers. To, th th this is uh, um, my take, but it's there in the text. So two ways that heavenly wisdom produces righteousness. How? What two ways do you think? No wrong answers, remember? Come on, what? Peace? Well, but specifically, peace where? In our relationship. So, yeah, the, the first one is in our own lives. Living in the, in the light of God's wisdom, we, we, we become increasingly pleasing to our, 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 our creator. Living in the light of God's wisdom, bathing in it, but also knowing who and how we are. We're, we're humbling ourselves. And in that humility, living in this godly wisdom, we become more and more pleasing to God. Le leading a good life, it says in verse 13. Leading a good life. What's a good life? A good life is a life that makes the creator of the universe smile. Leading a good life. Sorry, just spit. Leading a good life is living a life that makes the creator of the universe smile. Who wants to make God smile? Man, I do. Sorry, Lily. I do. And how do we make God smile? By, by living lives that are bathed in heavenly wisdom and leading lives that give him pleasure. Especially, especially in the context of chapter 3, Mark and the Christian, especially in the area of what? Our speech. 
giving God pleasure, leading a wise life in the way we speak, the way we speak to, to one another, but also the way that we speak about one another. And then, secondly, uh, the wisdom that produces a harvest of righteousness, it produces a harvest of righteous, righteousness in the lives of others. Okay, so how does that work? Well, the language of harvest suggests an attractive way of life. So here on the island, there's lots of fruit, right? You see a piece of fruit, what do you want to do? You want to eat it like, ah, this, this, I don't know, banana or papaya, whatever grows on pineapple, yes. Mango, yes. And, uh, and, you, and you, you, you just, oh, man, it, it looks great. And you just want to sink your teeth into it. And, it, and, and, it, and it, it, the, if we are living wise, godly lives, it's like we're being mangoes. And people see that in our lives, and they're like, I want that. I want all that you are conveying about the beauty of life. That's something that, that, that I don't have. And so the way we act, and specifically the way we speak, is very compelling, very attractive to other people in our lives. And it sometimes becomes a clincher for, for someone who, who's not living in Christ, who doesn't know, yet know Christ, and they see that, and they say, I want that. And, and they want to trust that what we have is life-giving and affirming and all that they need. Um, I told you whenever I, I was in university and we had the guy from crew come knock on the door and ask the, that math question, the percentage question. And after he, he said, would, y'all, would you be willing to do Bible study? And I'd already done Bible study, so I was like, yeah, I'll do Bible study. And there was this guy that got assigned to us. His name was James, uh, very fitting. Uh, and just a very uh, meek, it, but in, in, in a, such a godly way. Uh, he, in, in, in French, you say beau gosse. So uh, I don't, what would you say in English? Beau is, is beautiful and gosse is a, a kid or a guy. But like when you're, when you're good looking. When, like, yeah, but it's, it's, it's more cool. It's cooler than handsome. Like, what, well, I don't know, a stud? I don't know. I don't know what you'd say exactly. <laughs> but he, he was a beau gosse, but so humble. And, and, and he wasn't necessarily the most articulate person. But we, we would get together in Bible study with all, there was only one guy that was a Christian, and then me, who said I was a Christian, and then a couple other guys who had kind of grown up in the church, but they were partying, chasing girls, and, and like, we all were freshmen living on the same floor. It was craziness. When, when I moved into my dorm, um, the, it, it, things had been burned. All the people that were living in the dorm got kicked out because they had, they had flooded the fourth the fourth floor shower. So it was just one big, huge shower with like eight shower heads and then toilets with no stalls. It was just, five, it was a military dorm and they wanted to go swimming. And so they, they, they flooded the shower, which flooded into the bathroom. And so they were swimming in the, <laughs> in the bathroom and they, and they had put things at, uh, next to the door so that the water, and it, it was, I don't know how many gallons of water. And then they were like, dude, we're over this. But they, it took a long time for the water to go out. And so they just opened the doors and it flooded the entire the entire dorm from the fourth floor down, all this craziness. So they all got kicked out. And so we get into this dorm and we're all freshmen. And we had no idea what was going on, just stupid, crazy stuff. And James is very calm. And, and he, you know, he tried to keep us on, on task and we were all over the place. And, just, and then he, he, he would invite me to go get a Coke and just hang out. And I have to admit that I was so excited to just spend time with James, not because he, of the things that he said, but I just wanted to be with him just because he was just a nice guy and just life-giving and affirming. And for me, James, is like, he's like the perfect image of this, the, the harvest, because thanks to him and to other people, uh, a few months later, I, I asked Christ to be my savior. I, asked, I became a Christian because I was like, that, you know, I've been, I've been saying I'm a Christian, but this is all fake. It's plastic. It's artificial. It's a facade. And, and because he, he was authentic and real and just wise beyond his years, I wanted, I wanted that, what he had, because I knew I didn't have it. And so that's the, the thing for us. We can be, we can produce a harvest of righteousness if we have this godly wisdom in our relationships with other people. And we can be that for them saying, I want that. Next year, Keely, when you're going to have all those young people, 
the wisdom. They're, they're going to see Christ in you, and they're going to be like, I want to be like her. I want that. I want to have what, what she has that I don't have. So it's not a reflection question. This is a, uh, I don't know how much I've had to memorize scripture, but I want, I want us to take a few minutes, everyone, and memorize this, uh, James uh, chapter 3, verse 17, and, and, and ha- anchor it in your heart, and, and in your life be aware and, 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 and thinking about these lives that produce a harvest of righteousness in our own lives, but also in the lives of the people around us. So if you could take a few minutes and just memorize this, it would be great. Um, Lord, um, might it be (laughs) said of us that we be um, bathing in this wisdom that comes from you, that comes from heaven, that um, our lives might um, smell like Jesus, like Maddie said, that that our wisdom might be pure and peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, and that we might be impartial in all that we do, and Lord, might, we might be, our wisdom might be sincere from the heart in our relationships so that you can be glorified in our lives and receive ultimately uh, all the glory. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right. First three marks of mature Christian. According to James, what's the first one? He or she is patient and testing. Chapter 2, truth and faith. And we saw three different kinds of faith in chapter 2. Do you remember? First kind of faith, dead faith, which is purely purely intellectual. Demonic faith, which is shocker. Intellectual and emotional. Verse 19, the, the demons, they tremble. Uh, at uh, seeing Jesus. And then thirdly, what's the third kind of faith that we saw? Dynamic. Dynamic. And that involves what? Knowing, but also experiencing emotionally in our beings, but in our will. Our will. We will to do the, 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 the will of our Father. So dynamic, saving faith. In that, we express our faith by what we do. Who are the two examples, Old Testament examples that James used to talk about uh, dynamic faith? Abraham and Rahab. Awesome. You're tracking. This is very uh, encouraging. All right. So now we're moving on to the fourth characteristic of a mature Christian according to James, and it is she is a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. And this one, this one, this is where it really gets a little artificial. The, the information's there. I came up with a with an idea that is embedded in chapter four, but it's uh, it's uh, diced and chopped up pretty much in, in chapter four. So I, I had to bring things together in a little bit of a different way. It's all there. It's just a little more f- forced. So he or she is a peacemaker and not a troublemaker. And at the end, I hope you can understand what I mean by a peacemaker after we've done this whole section. So there are four parts to uh, this fourth characteristic uh, of a mature Christian. He or she is a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. Uh, And we're going to look at three battles, three enemies, and then three instructions that James gives um, to help us to remain a friend of God, i.e. a peacemaker. Uh, And we're going to read that now. So first part is uh, three battles. But we're going to read all 12 verses because the, the points A, B, and C are all mixed in. So we're going to read chapter 4, verses 1 to 12. Who would like to read? Go for it, Trent. Wait, what do you do? What does it say? You what? Hmm. Important. Okay. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know? What did he call him? You adulterous people. Not a compliment. Okay.
Continue, please. Who are we to judge our neighbors? So there are uh, three battles that we see in these first uh, 12 verses. And the first one we're going to look at is battling with others. So y'all studied John, right? How will the world recognize that we are Christians, according to John? By our love? One for another. Oh, what? Yeah. The world will know that we are followers of Jesus Christ because of our love for one another amongst the brethren. Wow. Early church. All, all throughout the, the, the New Testament, we're seeing people that are not getting along. First, First Corinthians 6, we got Christians bringing other Christians before a secular judge. What? Is that love showing it, expressing itself to one another so that the world knows that we're followers of Jesus Christ? Two Christians bring, going before a secular, non-Christian judge. Um, two women in the church of Santiki. I don't know how Evodi, Evodia. I don't know how what is it in, in English. So, so, come on. Santiago. Yeah, Santik and Evodi. What's the what's the other? What are, well, anyway, these two women. Paul calls them out. In his letter, he's writing to the whole church, and he's like, hey, ladies, <laughs> figure it out. Why can't y'all get it together? And all, even at the beginning of the, uh, of the, prim- uh, the early church, there was a, a battle between the, the, the Gentile Christians and the Messianic uh, Jewish Christians uh, over widows not getting enough food. They, they couldn't get it together. They weren't able to show their love for one another. And James is calling his people out. Christians should love one another in brotherly love. We shouldn't be judging one another because we're not the judge. And so James, he, he talks about several conflicts among, uh, amongst Christians in, in, in this book. So social levels, chapter 2, em- employers and employees, we'll see it a little bit in, in chapter 5. Um, uh, leaders, but that here in chapter 4, just people are not getting along. And why in the world are they not getting along? What's going on in their relationships? What's going on in their hearts? And basically, he's, he's saying, you know, y'all are just talking smack about one another. You're, you're talking badly about one another. You're judging one another. How in the world is this possible? Because you're sure not loving on one another. And, okay, here James is not saying that we shouldn't use discernment in our relationships. There's some people, uh, some Christians that I know, I'm, I'm not going to tell them everything because sometimes they, they're, they have loose lips. So I'm not judging them. I, I, you know, I, I love them in Christ, but I'm not going to necessarily share my deepest, darkest hurts and needs. So James here is not saying here, don't use discernment in your relationships. But he's saying, do not judge. And w- Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7. This, is, this echoes uh, chapter 7. You know, chapter, the, the first part of chapter 7, uh, Jesus is using a hyperbole, an exaggeration. Remember what he says, chapter 7, when he's talking about seeing your brother and seeing that thing. What thing is he talking about? Remember, this hyperbole. Yeah, the speck. And you're, oh my gosh, girl, get rid of that. And he says, before you tell them about that speck, what does he say? Get the log log out of your own eye. And in French, it's a poutre. And a poutre is is a beam. It's like a beam that that used to, in the frame of a house, which is 
and, and, and it's the same in German as well, Balkan, but it, it's bigger than a log. I mean, a log is already pretty big, right? But I mean, we're talking um, something big. So here's the deal. Even here at Anchor House, I'm sure that you would never judge one another, right? Never, ever judge one another, because according to James, it's not what we should be doing, i.e. it's sin, so we're not going to judge one another, but the, the thing is, we never, in any given situation, we never have all the facts. We never have all the elements. We don't know what this person has lived. Remember yesterday, hurt people, hurt people. Doesn't excuse the behavior, but it helps us to understand maybe where the behavior's coming from. We never really know the motives of anybody's heart. We might think we do, and we put the people into a box. Oh, yeah, yeah, she, she's like this. She does this all the time. So I'm sure that that's her motivation, right? No, we never know what's going on in someone's heart. And so James is saying if we speak badly of a brother or sister and judge them on the basis of what is surely partial evidence, because we never have all the elements, and then we, we're um, having these un healthy judgments about their motivations, what does James say that is? Sin. When we judge others, who are we to judge? Not, he's not saying don't use discernment in relationships. It's not what he's saying. But he's saying we cannot judge them because we don't have all the information. We don't know the mo motivations of their heart. It's a sin against the per that person, but it's also a sin against God. So, when we see all these conflicts between leaders, between churches, between Christians, we got to ask ourselves the question, why? Why in the world do we as believers in Jesus Christ have so many dadgum conflicts? Because we belong to the same family, we trust in the same Savior, we're indwelt with the same Spirit, and yet we're at conflict, we're, we're battling, excuse me, one another. And so James, he answered this question in this section. Why are we at conflict with one another? And he says, well, oh, just FYI, girl got game. She's definitely winning this argument. You can tell the, the dude he's going to lose already. Because somebody was saying, yeah, <laughs> she's definitely winning that argument. Uh, maybe it is. I don't know. He looks like he's kind of smiling, not taking it really seriously. She's into it. She's winning. She's, <laughs> she's definitely got the upper hand. Um, so he says, basically, the reason we have conflicts in our relationship with, with others is because there are battles going on within ourselves. Verse 1, where do conflicts and struggles among you come from? Is it not your passions that fight in your members? The reason y'all can't get it together in your relationships it's because you can't get it together in your own heart. The battle raging in our heart causes conflicts with others and causes conflicts in our churches. I, I've already talked to a few people uh, uh, this week, and they've told me, oh, yeah, our church split. We had a division. Something happened. Division, division. How? How is it possible? Well, lots of things going on in lots of people's hearts. And so our own selfishness and our sin are at the root of conflicts with others. Isn't it easy to say, okay, I'm in conflict, but it's their fault? It's really easy to say that, isn't it? It takes two to argue. It does take two to argue. And it takes two sinful hearts to be at conflict with one another. It's not always 100% somebody else's fault, is it? Be honest. It's never 100% the other's fault. You might have been wronged by someone. But the way you react to it, the attitude that you have after having been wrong with that person is just as much your responsibility as them taking responsibility for their, their actions against, against you. And so basically, our sin, our selfish sin, leads to wrong actions, verse 2. And then here's the kicker, verse 3. What does that lead to? So our wrong, uh, our battles going on within ourselves, it leads to sin. But then verse 3, what does it lead to? It leads to wrong what? Which is, this is the weirdest thing, but it's true because James says it. What does it lead to, verse 3? Wrong kind of what? Wrong kind of prayers. Oh, my gosh. 
We're at conflict in ourselves, which leads us to sin, which leads us to pray incorrectly. Woo! Because we're, 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 we're praying for the wrong things. And you know what? When our prayers are wrong, when our prayers are wrong, our Christian life is wrong. That's what James is saying. I'm not saying. I'm just, I'm just it's, it's, it's rough. It's tough. But that, he's getting in their faces saying, because of the sin in your own lives, you're asking for the wrong things in the wrong way, and so your lives are not producing fruit. They're not producing that attractive quality that people want to take a hold of. Au contraire. On the contrary, they, they, they're wanting to get away from it. What did, what did I ask you to repeat? Um, the, the sin that was going on? That, that, that lead, it's kind of selfishness, but it's, it's, not, it's not just that. It's the last of the Ten Commandments. I, I asked you to read it twice. Covet. covet. What, what's a, a, a synonym for covet? Keep on, keep on. Sorry, I, didn't, I mean, those are all right, but if you, you wouldn't go, oh, man, you're, you're coveting. What would you say? You are being jealous. jealous. Voila, thank you. Very good. So it's jealousy. And so it's interesting that do not covet, do not be jealous. That's the tenth of the Ten Commandments. But if we commit jealousy, it can actually push us to, to break all of the other commandments. If we uh, have... Uh, jealousy in our hearts, it can, it can push us to commit murder. It can push us to lie. It can push us to dishonor our parents. It can push us to commit adultery. And so we're, we break God's moral law because of this jealousy, this, the fact that we're coveting what other people have. And so if there's war going on inside of us, there's almost always war going on around us in our relationships. And so people who are at war with themselves because of their selfish desires, because of their jealousy, they're not very happy people. They're the disgruntled employer. If you are jealous, it is humanly impossible to be at peace with yourself, at peace with others, and at peace with God. And so jealous people, instead of being thankful for all the blessings coming down, Chapter 1, verse 17, coming down from the Father of lights, good gifts, continually coming down. Instead of being thankful for all those good gifts, for all these blessings that we're receiving, we're complaining about what we don't get, being jealous of what everybody else is getting as blessings, but not being thankful for these continuously coming down from heaven blessings, good, perfect gifts, and just thinking about what we're not getting. And so people who are jealous and who, who are coveting, they cannot get along with others because they want what others have. And so because we're at war with ourselves, we're at conflict with others, and ultimately, what does that mean? What do you think the third war that he, he's talking about in these first 12 verses? We're battling with God. What's the basis of all conflict? What is the basis of all conflict? Ever since the beginning, ever since the garden, what is the basis of all conflict? Yes, but in a, in a more negative way. In rebellion, rebellion against God, wanting to be like God, thinking that we can be like God, wanting to be our own gods, but rebelling against God. The basis of all conflict is rebellion against God in the end. And, and what is this rebellion called? Three-letter word. Rebellion against God. It's the basis of all conflict. It's sin. So that begs the question, how does a believer enter into war with God? This one is a, is a two-fold logic. So it's, I'm going to make you think a little harder. How do we as Christians enter into war with God? 
re rebelling against him and so sinning. But how do, we, how do we enter into it? So if you reject him, what are you going to do? Yeah, okay, yes. But thanks be to God, we have the Holy Spirit. But even as Christians, we do sin and we, do, we can fall into rebellion against God. Do you have an idea, Trent? Pride, yes. How, how, how do we rebel against God? It's a two, two, two-fold logic. It's, it's not easy to get there. Maddie Kate. Well, I think our vice is our own. Yes. So based on these, these 12 verses, what, is, what does it mean? What does it mean to be an enemy of God? Even as a Christian, he says it. Come on, what? Yeah, but in these verses, how do you read these verses? Verses 1 to 12, what, what is he saying? What is he saying? How, yes, but what, what is it? How, what makes us be in rebellion against God? Exactly. If you rebel against God, you become friends with God's enemies. If you rebel against God, you become friends with God's enemies. And in these verses, verses, he gives three enemies. What are the three enemies? The world. the world. How do you read it? The world is one of the enemies. The flesh, our sinful nature, and the devil. Excellent. All right. Um, we're just a couple minutes before the break, so we'll, we'll end there. Uh, and we'll start with three enemies uh, that we find in, in these verses. Okay? Thanks for your attention. <clears throat> Come back at 10.